And then I want, if I can, just in the last 10 minutes to talk about the power of the finance industry and how is it that we get that power exercised in a way that is uh, appropriate. So purpose and then power. But but uh, before I do that, um, I am going to, uh, have, can I put up, I just clicked the slides here, now, do I? There we go. That's what I'm I'm going to talk about. But before I do, I want just to do a quick um, a question to you. I'd like you to look at the following dozen words and choose the one that you think best summarizes the finance industry and its workings. And actually, we've got a way of doing this, Ninka, don't we, where, where we can do this on a poll, which I think you can explain to people. Yes, absolutely. So um, the question David is asking you, you can uh, answer it through the link in the chat. So in the chat, you will find a link. You can just click on it and it will send you to, to a web page where you can uh, type one of the words uh, David proposes. Uh, alternative ways are um, using the QR code on the slide or going to menti.com and filling in the code. So hopefully um, you can fill in some words. That, that's absolutely, I hope people can follow that. I know that on these things, I always get, uh, I have a difficulty in doing that, but I suspect many of the people are, that are listening are both younger than me and better at, uh, at these systems. But you will see the words I've chosen. They're, they're really quite broad in terms of what you might choose to describe the finance industry as. Complex, important, transparent, accountable, manipulated, self-serving, corrupt, selfish, effective, unstable. So Luke, let me just, I'm just going to give you 15 seconds, choose your word and type it in and uh, I will continue with the presentation and halfway through the presentation as well, if this works well, I'll be able to uh, tell you what it is that you've chosen. So I'll give you five more seconds. Look, I've chosen those broad and different words because I think when you look at the finance industry, you can find evidence of, of, of lots of things. Let's just talk about some of those bad things that, that Luke uh, uh, talked about. This is a, a picture of a, perhaps the poster child in the UK of, of the person who behaved um, uh, caught up most badly um, in the financial crisis, Fred Goodwin, he, he ran RBS. RBS, you may remember, uh, took over ABN Am AMRO, but it had its own problems as well. It went disastrously uh, bankrupt, but that didn't stop Mr. Goodwin from taking uh, £25 million for his pension. And I believe he now uh, lives in Monaco. And you can see how, therefore, whether fair or not, he became a poster child for what people see as being wrong about the banking system and about the finance system. So I'd like to introduce you to another banker. In fact, two bankers. Uh, Mozamat Taslima Begum is the chair of Grameen Bank and Mohammed Yunus is its chief executive. It's a bank that's based in Bangladesh. It has taken tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands, of mainly women out of poverty by making sure that they had access to finance. And this particular ceremony that you're seeing here is of a, a, a Mozamat and Mohammed receiving a Nobel Peace Prize for what they did. Two different views of banking. One where um, a, we're looking at somebody who generally is disparaged and one, I think the only business person in my lifetime um, to have uh, received a Nobel Peace Prize. And, and by the way, Eunice and Begum are not atypical financiers. If you dig back through the history uh, in Europe, um, I, I, here are some financial pioneers. The first pension fund, for example, was uh, it was established by two Scottish clergymen, two Scottish ministers. Wallace uh, and Webster, they set up the first proper funded pension fund. It lasted for 250 years. You can see Webster here 
uh, lecturing to his congregation in Edinburgh. And um, in, in, in continental uh, Europe, uh, uh, Friedrich Raffeson, uh, you still have the Rabo banks, and indeed, I think some Raffeson banks in some countries in Europe. This was a local government administrator who, like Eunice, saw that uh, agricultural uh, farmers needed to have credit to be able to buy the seeds for next year and so on. And so that was what he organized. And he organized those, like Wallace and Webster, like Eunice, because the functions of finance are so fundamentally important if we are going to uh, uh, be able to maintain human prosperity. So what are those functions? That, I think, is a question we too rarely ask. Indeed, I think you could probably uh, graduate with a master's in finance without ever having formally asked and considered the answer to those questions. So let me give, me give you let me give you my shot of what I think are the functions, the important things that finance needs to do for us that Wallace and Webster and Raffeson and Eunice were trying to achieve. I mean, one is simply that we need our money looked after. We need safekeeping. I understand in, in Belgium you have a law that says that every citizen can open a bank account. That's kind of interesting because in Brazil very recently we didn't have that. Two and a half million people therefore didn't know what to do if they had uh, any spare cash where they put it. They had to put it under the mattress. And I remember once meeting the, the governor of the Bank of Bangladesh who said the best thing that he ever did was to insist on a thing called the 10 taka account which meant that anyone who had eight uh, uh, euro cents uh, had to, could open a bank account in Bangladesh and that he knew that it was working street kids who, if they make any money, get robbed, were able to go into a bank and deposit their money there. Safekeeping, critically important. We take it for granted. Transactions, again, critically important. Uh, go to Kenya. There's an organization called Mpesa. It's organized through a cooperative bank and the mobile phone company that allows people, particularly migrant workers, to be able to transfer their pay back to their families instead of it being a horribly a, a difficult uh, thing to do. Uh, risk sharing, when you buy insurance or indeed when you buy a pension, uh, those who are going to uh, uh, live for a long time are insured by those who die early. Similarly, in the opposite direction, those who buy life insurance um, a, 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 those who die young benefit from the people who, who, who live for a longer time, or your house or your car or your ship at sea, risk it sharing, hugely important. And then there is the most important a, a, a function of finance, which is what they call intermediation. And that's taking our money from where it is, point A where it is, to point B where it's needed. A, our savings goes into the bank, gets loaned out. Our savings goes into a pension, buys the shares and the equities uh, in companies. And actually, you know, without intermediation and indeed without risk sharing and safekeeping and transactions, it's really difficult to see how we are ever going to address the really huge problems of the 21st century. Climate change, for example, absolutely demands that our money gets into more green uh, projects. Uh, pensions and looking after people in uh, old age uh, requires risk sharing. Development requires that we get money from where it is and where it's in surplus, typically in the north of the world, um, to developing parts of the globe, the south of the, of the world, and similarly uh, within our own societies from wealthy people to poor people and so on and so forth. We absolutely need finance if we are going to address the big problems of the 21st century. Uh, and, and we have uh, this industry, oh, let me go back one. We have this industry of banks and investment managers and insurance uh, companies. Here they're doing their intermediation and their risk sharing from savers on the left hand side uh, and those facing risks on the left hand side of the chart through the banks, the investment managers and the insurance companies through to investors, which are companies or someone uh, buying a house or someone borrowing for an education. That's the finance industry. We desperately need its services and we desperately need them to be carried out well. So the next question is, 
how well are they carried out? Because the finance industry certainly is big. Here's a graph of um, the scale of the finance industry relative to the rest of the economy. It's done for America, but it's the same in other countries as well. Uh, from the end of the 19th century up to about five years ago. As you can see, the finance industry has grown from about 2% of our GDP to nearly 8% of our GDP. And by the way, it's been providing more service as well. If you measure the service as being taking money from point A where it is to point B where it's needed, we can measure what that intermediation, the intermediated assets as a multiple of the GDP. And you can see with the green line, it's growing pretty well the same rate as the intermediated assets in the orange line. So the scale of the finance industry has been growing, both in terms of the amount of money that's been intermediated and in terms of this, the pickup on the GDP. But look, here's something else that we can tell from that graph, which is that you would expect, wouldn't you, that over time, it would cost less and less and less to be able to intermediate one euro from our savings and then to invest it. And you can tell whether that's happened or not by thinking about how much did it cost to have the uh, finance industry? Did we need to pay for the finance industry? And how many assets has it intermediated? And those of you that are good at maths will see that requires uh, dividing the orange line by the green line. And what we get here is a measure of the productivity of the finance industry. The green line this time is just the raw data, and then a, the orange line is one that has been adjusted for the fact that we've got smaller savers now and little companies and those sorts of things. But the big lesson from it is that amazingly, it costs about the same today to intermediate um, a euro than it did 120 years ago. There is no other industry that has got anything like as terrible a record in productivity as the finance industry. It's as though the finance industry just takes a constant cut of the money uh, that is put into it. The, the author of this study, a professor at a, a New York University called Thomas Philippon, French uh, professor, um, uh, uh, concluded that the finance industry which funds the internet is no more efficient than the one that funded the railroads. That is a shocking conclusion. Uh, for those of you that are less mathematical and uh, uh, are, are, are thinking, uh, what, what is, um, what's David on about here? I had an animation, but that's not going to work, I think. Is it a, a I don't think that's going to work, Ninka. So, so what's happened here is that we've moved from a simple financial system where people would have deposited their money in the bank that Friedrich Raffeson had set up, that it would be loaned out to them. It would be loaned out to them and to others as they needed it. And that the cost of doing that, even with a, a you know, paper ledgers and so on and so forth is the same as the cost today. And the cost today is made up of a whole load of apparent expertise of people who are fund managers, who are analysts, who are uh, accountants, who are data gatherers, who are traders, and um, uh, all of them apparently having fundamentally important roles that they should be carrying out. And by the way, if you catch me, I will be able to explain to you why it is that you need a custodian uh, for your savings. I'll be able to explain to you why it is that you need an accountant and why it is that you need somebody who will be able to trade your shares and so on and so forth. But the reality is that all that extra expertise means that the finance industry has not added um, or, or has not passed on any productivity increase to a, the real world. And I think one of the reasons that it can do this 
is because uh, we have assumed that the finance industry will work well simply by having markets and being competitive. I, I, I don't know how many of you have done economics courses, particularly any of you that have traveled to the United States and done economics courses, but you'll know that in Economics 101, um, we're taught that people competing one against the other, they will always have to serve the consumer, therefore products will get ever better um, a, 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 as they compete one against the other. But clearly in finance, in aggregate, that's not happened. And it's not happened, I think, because of something called asymmetric information. Let me see if I can give you an example of asymmetric information. I want you to imagine that you're Joe. So Joe's 25 and she's starting to save for a pension. She's a very uh, canny woman uh, indeed. And she intends to save for 40 years and then she's going to retire. And then the pension's going to have to last for another 20 years because she thinks she might live until she's 85. And her pension provider tells her that the charge will be 1% for the fund manager and then another 1% that will cover all the costs of trading and custodial and all of those sorts of things, reporting and so on and so forth. So tell me if that's right. I think you can understand that she saves for 40 years, draws down over 20 years. How much of Joe's possible pension is she going to receive when those fees have all been paid? If you've got a pen, just write down the number. They're charged every year, remember. Write down the number that you choose. Oh, we've got a, have we got a poll here? Let me give you the answer. Here's the graph. So if they, if they, oh, we've got the, yeah, uh, we've got the, Wow, people are pretty good at mathematics in Belgium. Um, I, if you, if here's a graph that shows how much of your pension disappears as a result of the charging of fees. If there's no fees, none of it disappears in fees. Uh, if you charge half a percent a year, 15% disappears in fees. 1%, 27% disappears in fees. 2%, which is the example we gave, if you remember, that's 1% for the fund manager, 1% for trading nearly half of your money has gone in fees. Now, I think we only had seven people answer this. No one guessed that it was more than the, that half disappearing, and three guessed that it was less. What's happened here? I think what's happened and what happens again and again and again in the finance industry is that those that are in the finance industry are able to use their expertise to their benefit without it translating into the benefit for somebody else. Because of course, you hope that the finance industry would be absolutely square, upfront and honest about how much was disappearing in fees. Certainly in my country, that is definitely not what happens. Rather, if people can be, uh, uh, will turn a blind eye to fees, that's what um, people will be, will be happy uh, uh, to do. So uh, that happens again and again and again, the asymmetric information where the finance industry, to put it in the words of the former head of the Federal Reserve Bank, the finance industry is able to increase the rent that it takes, money that it can have, which it didn't need to take in order to provide a good service to people. And unless we start by measuring purpose, and stop just looking at competition and markets and all of those sorts of things. We're never going to we're never going to discover this. But look, let me just do a, a quick conclusion before I finish on purpose. I think the next slide, uh, uh, Ninka, was the was the outcome of um, the words that people chose. Do we have an outcome of that? Hmm. Self-serving. Oh, self-serving twice, complex, manipulated, also important. That, that's interesting. I, 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 that, that's a, a, a really uh, a interesting, uh, selfish there as well. A little bit, little bit complex. Let me go back to my presentation, Link. I'll show you what other people um, have, uh, have said about this. So the Bank of England did this very study and they did this study, first of all, looking at people who were in the finance industry 
And the people that were in the finance industry thought they were regulated. Uh, and there's some truth in that. There's a vast amount of regulation. They were important. They were accountable. They recognized some of that volatility. Do you see selfish there anywhere? No. So the people in the finance industry didn't see it that way. The Bank of England also asked the population of Britain what they thought. And they thought the finance industry was corrupt. That's, I think, even worse than selfish. Using its power to enrich itself rather than to serve those that it ought to be uh, uh, there to serve uh, a, a, a corrupt. And I, I, I find this so challenging because here we have a finance industry that is absolutely vital to the changes of the 21st century, whose pioneers, and you can see this happening lots in the developing world, were people who were social reformers wanting to do good. And yet we perceive it as being something where selfishness has been allowed to run riot. Uh, and even in this case, uh, uh, it, it's reached a stage of corruption. And, and I believe some of that is because of the way we study finance. We think of it as being full of selfish people who providing they compete against each other will give us a good outcome. But as we've seen just on that Philippon evidence, this, this isn't clear that that's how it works. So look, just some observations about purpose, and then I'm going to spend 10 minutes on power. The finance industry is fundamental if we're going to address the challenges of the 21st century. And yet people are suspicious of it. And I would say they are right to be suspicious of it. It's not possible that a competitive industry could be producing no increase in efficiency and productivity when we've invented computers and telephones and all of those sorts of things in the last 120 years. So it's not doing its job well. And I think we need a new starting point, which is a demand from all of us that we develop a finance system that is built to fulfill purpose. So a pension that will last from the day you retire until the day that you die. We hardly have that in the private sector in the UK uh, 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 any longer. And by the way, I think if you were to design that, you actually you don't need that huge amount of regulation that we saw that the finance industry itself uh, uh, complains of complains of providing that you've designed the system fit for purpose in the first place. And I think right now, as the evidence shows from Philippon, it's very far from being that. But look, it's not just the utility of the finance industry that we need to go for. Uh, we need to think about the power of the finance industry as well. And this is what uh, always really interested me, I, I, I guess, because brought up in the in the you know, the 60s, 70s and 80s, um, a, 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 the time of the Cold War, where uh, those um, on, the, on the communist slash socialist side would say, look, the, 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 the effect of capitalism, of the ownership of capital um, is so awful that we need to find a different system. And indeed, you know, from, from Berlin right to Vladivostok, there were a whole set of countries where uh, there was no private capital. And then from Berlin West um, was, was a system where the, the power that that gave to the state was seen to be so huge um, that, that, that we needed to stick with the, uh, with the capitalist system. And, and it, we nearly fought a war about that. We nearly destroyed civilization on the basis of that. And the idea was that the capitalists were a small number of very wealthy people a, an ever uh, increasingly small number of ever wealthier people, and we couldn't allow the power into their hands. But here's a really interesting thing. That power was to be exercised through their ownership of the shares, the equity in companies. Uh, equity, you'll have seen it actually mentioned in the graph where we looked at the banks and the insurers and the, and the, uh, 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 the investment managers. Uh, uh, Equity is something where you own a share of the company. You don't have a contract of what you're going to get out. You own a share and you are given power. In particular, you're given the power to be able to approve who it is that is in the board of directors that runs the company. 
So who is it that owns the shares in the big companies of the West? Do you know, if you look at the shareholder register, you won't often come across the name of an individual person. You'll come across the name of an institution like BlackRock or Vanguard or Amundi or Allianz or Schroders. Big fund managers. But where does their money come from? It doesn't belong to BlackRock or to Vanguard. It belongs to millions upon millions of people who are saving for the future, typically saving for a pension. Uh, I did this, this is uh, some years old now, it's changed a little bit, but the, the message is still absolutely the same. Of the ownership of companies in the UK, a, a, and, and, and I said, okay, let's look at how many are owned by pension funds and institutions, representing thousands and millions of people in the UK. How many by the similar institutions representing thousands of millions of people, uh, internationally and how much by individuals. I've called them wealthy investors and I had my daughter do this little graph. As you can see, the ownership of companies in the UK is in the hands of millions upon millions of people, including likely yourself and your mum and dad and your brothers uh, and sisters where there are savings. Here it works. We've got individuals who invest their money in pension funds or directly with fund managers who then buy shares that gives them the right to appoint the board of directors, who then are responsible for the management of the companies, who then employ individuals. And there's a big ecosystem around them of pension advisors and accountants and voting agencies and investment banks and all sorts of, and all sorts of uh, 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 things like that. But it's millions of people who own companies. Indeed, the one company in the UK, a big company, did this exercise for me where I said, can you look back through all the pension funds and fund managers and check how many people benefit when you pay a dividend? And so they did that exercise. They gave up counting when they went above 250 million people that they had as their shareholders and that they should be thinking about. And it seems to me that that has really interesting implications. I mean, look, how can it possibly make sense if you've got 250 million or maybe even more uh, as shareholders to be making your money by polluting the environment and creating climate change that will destroy the very world that they want to be living in when they take their pension? That's absolutely bonkers that we should be doing that. We should be using the power of our money to make sure that the people who are running our companies are doing that to our benefit. And of course, we want them to make a profit because we need a pension out of it or we need uh, 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 the money back, what, whatever we're going, to, we're going to do with it. But we don't want them doing that in a way that is going to destroy the planet or destroy our society. So look, here's my, here's my idea as a challenge on the power of finance. Look, why don't we assert our rights? Why doesn't everybody who's got an insurance policy or a pension fund simply say this to their fund manager? First of all, thank them very much for doing a very important job, which is to look after your money and make sure that uh, it's invested in good places that will give you a pension in the future. But don't turn a blind eye to climate change. So I've said, look, Climate change is a huge challenge for everybody's future. The actions of big companies, particularly energy companies, for example, they make a big difference to climate change. So when BlackRock or Vanguard or Amundi or any of these pension funds or fund managers, when they are voting directors, can't they assure us that they will never approve the appointment of anyone who's not committed to manage their company in a way that is compatible with the Paris Climate Agreement which is one that will mean that the planet is sustainable. Because right now we are allowing them to do that with our money. It's our votes being used to perpetuate, I think, the wrong sort of power through the financial system. So look, I've talked a little bit about pur uh, purpose and I've talked a little bit uh, about uh, uh, power. Here's just some concluding thoughts. The purpose of the finance industry 
is profoundly important to the degree where the early pioneers in fi finance are social pioneers, not rich, wealthy individuals. It is doing a pretty poor job today in being able to look after our money, help us with transactions, to help us share risk and to intermediate. Um, I, I think if we're going to get that right, we need to change the way that we think about this industry, the way we study it and the way we structure it so that it is fit for purpose. But the one thing that we have got that is extraordinarily important in bringing this about is that the money in the finance system, it's our money. We have got the ability and the system uh, expressing our views has got the ability to make a difference by the way that it votes its shares, the way it appoints the directors uh, to uh, uh, our industry and to the rest of the economy. And we must demand that it does that right on our behalf. And that is my quick synopsis in 35 minutes. Um, I hope it's raised uh, questions. I'm sure that uh, there are be some people that disagree with what I've said, but I'd just like to say thank you uh, for listening, um, which seems to be in very small writing indeed, but thank you. Well, thank Luke, you, David. let me hand over to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, David, for uh, this very clear uh, introduction into the what you mean by the purpose of finance. Um, there is a, a longer text that David uh, wrote. Uh, I invite everybody to look into it. It gives uh, the longer argument, but you have the bulk of the argument in, in this fairly short expose. Um, I think it's it's fundamental. Uh, it asks questions about the utility and the efficiency of financial services. One would think that this very complex system is highly efficient, but, but if you look at uh, labor efficiency and uh, labor productivity, how it increased over the last 100 to 150 years, and then you look at the data that uh, David gives, uh, you have to conclude that in terms of uh, uh, pure uh, uh, productivity gains, it's disastrous. And so in, in, in a sense, it's, it squares with what the public here uh, sees as a self-serving system. Um, mainly the, the rent that comes out of the system has gone through the financial system itself, which is one of the reasons why it's such a big part now of our um, GDP. Um, so there is a question of the efficiency of the system, the utility of it. And the second question that David DeBortz is about the governance of the system in which uh, he points out that basically it serves everybody. And that's clear with pension funds. Uh, so if you look at pension funds, uh, uh, it's uh, meant for everybody at the same time, if you look at the governance of pension funds, um, whoever had contact with the people who really uh, do the asset management of their pension fund. So you have all the pensions uh, taking part in pension funds, yet we have no contact whatsoever. So there is, a, I think, a serious questions to be put there. Um, I would like to add something to that. Um, in, in a sense, uh, what I, what I think is also lacking is a certain ambition, and it's an ambition that the entire financial system, in a sense, lacks, uh, not just uh, the financial players, but also the regulators. Um, uh, and I can, I can pinpoint that uh, quite through a very sim in a very simple way. I think you can ask two questions. Is, uh, one is where does the money come from, uh, and two is where does the money go to? And we lack ambition in both, I would say. So where does the money come from? Well, think about all these systems we have on uh, um, anti-money laundering, AML systems, which have become quite complex. Huh? So uh, um, it's clear that, that it happens. Yet at the same time, and we had some scandals uh, not so long ago uh, involving very serious banks and banks uh, in Holland and in Denmark, um, in which um, enormous streams of uh, dirty money get into the system without any problem. Um, do, we, do we really put the question, where does the money come from? Do we have to play it stronger? It is already, we do already steps in that direction, but I'm pretty sure that the integrity of the system is something that needs and should be strengthened. Um, there is a, another colleague called Dembinski who talks about la vocation des marchés financiers 
Uh, so he, he talks about as a vocation, which I think is true. The financial system has a in, tremendous impact on the functioning of your economic system and by that also on society. Uh, but it has a certain vocation and that you see in the, the old bankers, which uh, David referred to, you see that vocation happening with Bethesda and other people. Now, now that, that could play its part today also. So you have the ambition to do that or you don't. And it starts with where does the money come from? And it start and goes, where does the money go to? So what do you fund? What do you fund? And there again, we see that uh, we look at financial characteristics of financial instruments, but we hardly look at non-financial characteristics of where the money goes through. And again, we see steps in the right direction, I would say. And, and there I hint to the use of what we call ESG information environmental, social, and governance information, ESG information, is now entering and mainstreaming in the financial markets. I'm pretty sure that it will mainstream. I've been part of the Visual Iris initiative. Uh, we have recently been bought by Moody's, uh, together with Standard & Poor's, uh, the large, um, well, they, they go over all financial assets and uh, give a kind of quality stamp on these financial assets. Now they try to do that also with ESG information. It's just a small start, but it matters. Yeah, It really uh, shows where your money ends up and what it does in terms of impact on the world. That, that should be the ambition. Um, can you move your financial system in the direction that it has a larger and more positive, clearer impact on the world? Absolutely. Uh, but first you have to measure, you have to see where it ends up the money. And again, we, we see a system that uh, any respects doesn't doesn't care too much about where it ends up. Now I don't want to to limit that only to um, the financial players. I also want to invoke the regulators. I believe also regulators lack ambition. Uh, regulation looks at at the uh, the safety of the uh, investor, of the retail investor mainly, customer protection. Um, certainly in the American regulatory system, this is a very important one. And next to that, they look at what we call systemic stability, stability of the financial system. Since the crisis of 2008, this has been all over the place. Systemic stability is now the central thing which we try to look at. But what do we mean by systemic stability? What do we mean the financial system or do we mean the system as a whole, the entire societal system? And what is Given the pivotal part that finance play, given it's really, yeah, it's the spider in the web, I believe one, again, one should be more ambitious as a regulator um, to look at how this systemic stability from the entire uh, societal point of view is guaranteed rather than only from the financial point of view. And again, we see elements in this direction. We're starting to see that regulators look, for instance, at uh, emissions at the impact of the Paris Agreement on the um, companies, on banks, on what will it mean for portfolios, we start to look at it, but it shouldn't stop there. We should be more ambitious and look really at the impact of the financial system on society as a whole. Customer protection, yes, well, we look at products and we have uh, for each product, the whole set of uh, uh, rules that need to be followed and we have a uh, uh, very, uh, extensive legal document connected to it. Yet at the same time, the kind of governance that David talks about, how do we bring this, these people who really buy and use these financial instruments who provide the money, how do we take more of their ideas into account and their governance also into account? So again, it's about knowing your customer, but not just your financial profile of the customer, also what do people want from their pension? And how do they want it to work? Well, we could we could take steps and be more ambitious in order to bring that about. Um, I believe that regulators also need to do a better job on bubbles. Um, um, I, I, one of the elements or one of the uh, stories that I would uh, like to refer to is the one that uh, um, is really uh, excessive is what happened in Japan at a certain moment. It, uh, that's uh, some time ago in the 80s. In the 80s, Japan was confronted with a tremendous real estate crisis in which uh, the real estate prices went up um, manifold. 
And at a certain moment in time, the Imperial Palace in, in Tokyo, which is a very nice place, and it's a large green ground in the middle of this massive city, which is Tokyo. Um, at the height of this crisis of this real estate bubble, uh, the, the value of this state, of this, the Imperial Palace in Tokyo, was almost identical to the value of all buildings in Canada, which is ridiculous, which is obvious to everybody very ridiculous. I mean, what, why, why cannot a regulator intervene in this type of excessive uh, risk taking, which is, takes place then in your financial system? I mean, there, there is a, I would say, a certain lack of ambition, even if it's very difficult to do. You, you see it, you see it clearly. At least try. There is, there is, there are very, very few other uh, parts of our economic system that that have this lack of ambition. I would say. So if you have a, man, a product which is manifestly uh, toxic, you wouldn't be able to sell it. You wouldn't be able to sell it. So how to move on? Strengthen the integrity of the system by looking much better, even much better now, where the money comes from. Improve the impact by increasing the ESG information, by increasing the non-financial information, and to look at where is the impact of the things you invest in and where does it end. Um, there is a sense in which finance can start to educate its customers also in this respect. So, the, for instance, in uh, to make a comparison with the food sector, uh, we now have, and it comes from France, we have a system in which what we call the nutrition score. Uh, sometimes when you go shopping, for instance, in uh, in Deleuze or, or uh, here in um, Coldright, uh, you will see a score ranging from A to F, I believe, on, on nutritional products. Now that score gives you hmm, uh, a kind of an idea how healthy this product is. All that the, the food industry does at that moment is provide you with certain information. Now we have seen in the last year when we introduced this, that the sale of A and B of the best labeled products um, increased by 35%. So people value the fact that you bring information on what the final impact of this product on their on their health will be. They value it, they use it. It should be possible for financial products. It should be possible there. And again, it's a question of ambition. Do you dare to go this way? Now it's a very self-contained system. And all we look at is, um, are we not going bankrupt? But that's too limited. It's not just financial systemic stability, it's societal systemic stability, which is at stake. I would say. So this is to add on um, David's expose. Um, please collect questions and uh, send them through the chat. Uh, I will take a look at them. Um, on the meantime, I now pass the floor to, the, to Frank, who has uh, the critical voice of Fairfin behind him. Frank. You have the floor. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, it's a very interesting presentation, uh, which, which David uh, gave. Uh, I didn't know him before. Uh, uh, I read his paper and I wanted to start out. I have three points actually, uh, which I want to talk about. One is like, uh, I want to ask the question whether it is surprising that so little attention is being given to purpose uh, in finance. I will argue why it doesn't surprise me that much, even though the, but that doesn't mean that I, that I find the exercise very interesting. Uh, otherwise, I also want to go a little bit deeper into why purpose is about much more than productivity. Uh, it's also about, um, uh, serving society uh, uh, at large and even though it is being mentioned I think on the conceptual level it needs it needs uh, 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 doesn't have its proper place uh, yet um, uh, um, and then uh, I want to also go into the topic of power which I'm, I'm also happy that uh, uh, David has already uh, mentioned and one example why I don't find it so surprising that uh, there's so little attention for uh, for purpose is I want to give an example. So there's you have these um, divestment campaigns since a few years where there's like students and everything and universities and people at uh, other uh, institutions 
wants uh, that their school, for example, doesn't invest any money anymore in um, in, in fossil fuel companies because it's it's bad for uh, tackling climate change. And we we in Belgium we work with these students who want to go uh, to to uh, deal with this question, do a campaign in their university. And one of the things that we saw that happened is once that they uh, ask this question uh, um, um, to the the financial uh, uh, um, responsible uh, person of the university, that the the answer was always like uh, they weren't negative; they were just like, "Why do you ask me this question?" Because this person is really not used that somebody asks him another question than whether or not uh, the money that's being invested has a good financial return. So, uh, and I, and this is widespread. It 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 um, it uh, I, it's a parallel, I think, uh, or symbol of what we see uh, uh, more broader uh, in the financial sector. And I think that there's like the four uh, goals that have been uh, mentioned. But there, the overarching one, uh, the existential one, is profitability. And it's the one that we don't really mention, but where we we give really uh, uh, a very big, uh, even though there's so much regulation, we give a very uh, a lot of leeway to uh, to um, to investors and, and owners of banks and managers, managers etc. to uh, do what they think uh, will help them to uh, maximize um, um, uh, um, the money, uh, and I think this this uh, this is also detrimental to the purposes that we that we have been talking about. Take for example uh, intermediation. One of the things that that we see in the financial sector is that when times go well, when the economy is doing well, banks want to lend a lot because they think that it will. Uh, they will make a lot of money if they lend a lot of money. But once the economy goes bad, they lend a lot less. So they intermediate less, one of the uh, very important purposes of a financial system, because uh, they think they will make less money out of it. They will fulfill less uh, the function, this function that they're uh, supposed to uh, fulfill. Um, so we really need to uh, uh, integrate the fact that profitability or at least what uh, uh, actors uh, perceive as uh, actions that will uh, lead to uh, profits at least in a quite short uh, to medium uh, term um, this will uh, this has a very uh, this has a very important uh, uh, role I think and if we don't if we don't give this a proper place in in the actual situation and I don't know how are we going to have a, a decent discussion about uh, 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 another purpose of uh, of, of a financial uh, institution, a bank, uh, or or otherwise. And then I come to my my second point on uh, that the purpose is is larger than uh, and the productivity. Um, that is that um, uh, David made this this uh, uh, parallel to like the the period when he grew up in the Cold War. Um, I, I'm from a little bit later. Uh, I know the Cold War mostly from the history books. Uh, but what I find an interesting uh, parallel in some way, I think it's maybe uh, a bit uh, uh, um, uh, not very nuanced, but I, I think it's interesting just in a conceptual way. In some ways, you could say that the very big financial institutions uh, and the financial sector is uh, dominated by very big financial institutions that in some way, they have a kind of similar role as the planning bureaus in in communist uh, uh, societies because they are the not the only but very important places where resources are allocated in uh, our economic system so the these the decisions that they make of where money is going to be invested uh, have a very big impact on uh, uh, what we are what kind of uh, economic activities will exist in the future and this is why david is very right to say that we have to uh, take a lot of uh, uh, we really need to uh, think about uh, uh, climate change uh, how how this is going to be integrated in uh, investment decisions uh, and uh, other like social issues uh, etc as as um as luke was already uh, also talking about uh, with this esg uh, um the importance of 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 better looking at uh, environmental and the social 
uh, aspect uh, of investment and also in the way in which companies that uh, are being invested how they are how they are run the governance aspect um, and and we we should really uh, think of a way in which uh, uh, how can we give the same uh, uh, importance to uh, uh, these um, what I would say is added value for society and and we let's say we, we don't have the right accounting right? if you see a balance sheet of a, a bank it's all about it's all about financial numbers it's not about uh, what is the kind of a, what I can find a kind of a dirty word in economics which are called externalities which are the social costs or the environmental costs of uh, uh, a company we should find a way, and I think uh, on the level of, of climate or uh, biodiversity, but also if we want to deal with inequality, um, it's, it's very urgent um, that we can uh, uh, integrate this uh, in, in the ways uh, in which we make decisions to, to allocate the resources uh, in our economy. Um, and this actually, uh, I, we, we, have, uh, we have some work on it, and it, it's funny because we, we have looked, and not only we, also other uh, NGOs and research organizations that we have worked with, um, we looked at it, have looked at it a bit in a uh, different way. For example, we have this uh, uh, campaign on a, a bank which was nationalized uh, after 2008. Uh, before it was Dexia, and now is uh, Belfius. It has been 100% uh, taken over uh, by the government. And we say, okay, you should. Uh, uh, you should use this bank now and put it uh, to service of society. We were looking at, okay, um, we are very well aware that there's many public banks uh, in the world that, that are not uh, performing very well, but we found some really nice uh, uh, examples. Um, in Germany, for example, there, is, there are also bad, but also very good examples. And what we saw in the best examples is that these uh, banks, they have a, a mandate, which is democratically uh, uh, created. And which is which creates the purpose of the banks because it said these and these and these are the goals this is what you have to focus on and these are more important than uh, uh, how much profit uh, you make yes of course you have some kind of uh, uh, profitability level but it's they don't need to make the, the the returns which are existing elsewhere in the in the financial sector and they also have a control mechanism because inside their board they have supervisory boards where people, where different kind of stakeholders from everywhere in society uh, have a role and they, they're not going to check every loan that has been given, but they will, on the, on the broader scale, they will check whether the bank is implementing the mandates or not. Um, so these are for us uh, uh, important uh, things to, uh, to, to, to consider. And these are for us, uh, we think, would be uh, uh, important steps to go towards a financial system where there is a more uh, focus on, on uh, uh, purpose. Now we're going to go to the, the last point, uh, which is about uh, power. We think that um, uh, um, the power, it's really important. And I think it's, it's interesting, David, what you said about um, that we are so many people own uh, actual, are the actual owners of uh, all the companies, etc. Um, it's true, but like on the one hand, and I think on this level, I'm quite sure you agree with me. But if not, then uh, that's okay too. Uh, that of course, like uh, we're the actual people. There are so many steps away of uh, of influencing the investment decisions that um, it's difficult to get a hold of this. But there is also a more uh, uh, a deeper question here, which is that uh, if you would compare this to like uh, the democratic political system, is that um, in, in the companies where uh, indirectly all of us who have banking accounts and are, have a, we, we put premiums in our pension funds and insurance uh, portfolios, et cetera, uh, in the end, we're like a census uh, suffrage. It's the same system is as it's it's like the electoral system as it existed in the 19th century where when you had a, a big house or you had a horse uh, or you had other possessions you had maybe more than one vote because it's not one shareholder one vote it's one share one vote uh, so the richer you are the more influence you have uh, in the uh, in the decisions of the company 
So we could say that this is not really uh, democratic. Um, but uh, but what I mainly want to uh, say about the, the power issue is that I think we should really think more about um, how from the outside of the financial sector, we can have more leverage. And uh, I've heard many uh, things and I think it's very quite normal because um, well, you're not all inside the financial sector right now, but I think in comparison to me, you're uh, more into the sector than, than we are. Uh, and I think all the appeals you make on people inside the sector, I, I, I really think it's good to, to do. But it's also important to try to uh, empower people who are not inside the financial sector and uh, that we other people have very a lot of legitimacy to go decide what the purpose of uh, um, finance should be. Uh, and I think that one of the main important things is that uh, since 2008, as have been said, um, not only were banks bailed out in 2008, but they have been, banks and financial markets at large, they have been dependent on uh, public support and dozens, uh, thousands of billions of euros and yen and, and dollars actually to, uh, to, to stay there and to make sure that they, they can keep on running even though they're not, these, the, the structural problems are not decently uh, 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 dealt with. Uh, and we see this now again, even though that the economic crisis uh, as a result of Corona is uh, is not uh, uh, is didn't originate in the financial sector. Financial sector gets a lot of support to to stay afloat and to make sure that these critical uh, functions that we've been talking about that they keep on doing this uh, for to guarantee schemes to make sure that um, banks can keep on lending, even though a lot of companies cannot uh, uh, pay their credit back right now which is a, such a very important thing to do. If these um, functions of these banks are so important, then the support we give to them, in exchange, we could ask, it was only leg le legitimate, I think, that we ask uh, uh, some structural changes uh, uh, in compensation. Um, and I think these kind of leverages in the, in the public uh, discussion, we are not aware yet uh, uh, enough yet uh, of this and this is also like a responsibility of uh, the civil society to become more aware about this and to uh, seize these uh, opportunities um, so that was it for me yeah, thank you Frank um, I, I move on immediately to Tom uh, Tom who works at Fablefin and is uh, the Fablefin label uh, one of the inventors, let's say, and the caretaker of this label. Tom, the floor is yours. Tom, can you hear us? I was still on mute. Ah, okay. It's a classical problem. Uh, all right, I will share my video also. Uh, right. I think that everybody can see the slides now. Um, we um, we heard a lot about financial institutions can can do better, and there certainly is a lot that can be uh, improved. But nevertheless, there are also some things that uh, the financial sector already does uh, quite well. So. Uh, there is no doubt even uh, the critical voices that that the financial sector has a, a societal uh, important role to play and that to a, a great extent uh, that is already also played. Uh, I will touch upon uh, three things, four tasks of the financial sector and then specifically the banking sector. Then a few words on ESG integration in the financial sector and then uh, how the financial sector can help reorienting to, towards uh, a more sustainable uh, world and society. Um, first about the core tasks, David already listed them. Uh, we, it is indeed, I have the same three. Uh, David had four, but, but the risk sharing is more an insurance uh, type of, of task for the banking sector is indeed transforming savings to credits and the, the, the 
intermediation task that's indeed crucial then of course also the safekeeping of deposits and facilitating the whole uh, payment system and, and transactions um, and that task that is for for the the belgian financial sector uh, certainly fulfilled i, I am not uh, uh, I'm only talking uh, or painting the picture for the Belgian financial sector, which is quite different from uh, the UK financial sector, I guess. Uh, uh, the Belgian financial sector is very much uh, based on, on giving credits to, to uh, individuals, to companies and to public authorities. And that is the main task of the Belgian financial sector. And here on this slide, we see uh, how this is done. Eh? Uh, the fin Belgian financial sector, the Belgian banks give uh, 250 billion uh, euros of, of, of credits to, to households, and eh? mainly mortgages, also to companies and to the public authorities. 80% of the Belgian economy is financed by banks and by the banking sector. If you look, um, to for instance the uh, in the united states the banking sector only finances 20 percent of the economy so that's a completely different picture uh, if you look at the type of banks and uh, the belgian banks if you look at the balance sheet uh, 80 percent of the balance sheet consists of loans granted to uh, individuals companies smes and governments so that's the the major part of the balance sheet, the the equity part of the balance sheet, something you see in investment banks, is in the Belgian banks less than three percent. So it's almost negligible. Just to paint a picture of the difference between the Belgian banking sector and and the more Anglo-Saxon UK banking. The banks also. Uh, uh, take up their role in this uh, extraordinary uh, corona crisis. Uh, just to give one of the examples, we already, uh, the, the guarantee schemes were already uh, mentioned, but there is also this postponement of payment of loans. Mm -hmm. So during this crisis, uh, individuals, um, corporates, have uh, under circum certain uh, circumstances of course have been granted the postponement of the payment of their loans until the end of the year just to give them more breathing space um for for yeah for, for keeping their their business and their families uh running a second thing i want to, to talk about was ESG integration. Uh, ESG is 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 very much uh, integrated in um, in the financial sector more and more, and and for 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 two reasons. And uh, that's uh, in literature they talk about a double materiality. That means the impact or the importance of the impact of, of society and, and the planet on the stability and the profitability of the financial sector on the one hand, but also in the other direction, ESG is, in, is important and material because the financial sector can have a very big impact on society. So in both directions, uh, ESG plays a role and has to be integrated. And, and, and most regulations that, um, that are evolving are, are being uh, drafted now take into account this double materiality. Uh, in the past, the materiality, or initially, uh, the focus was on climate risk, and, and the regulation focused very much on the impact of climate change on the stability of the financial sector. Now, more and more with new regulations, we see that also the other direction, uh, the, the, the impact and, and possible negative impact uh, of the financial sector on the planet is taken into account. Uh, when we talk uh, about the regulations that take into account this, this double materiality, 
uh, we see a whole lot. I have made a list. This list is not complete. And these are all the regulatory initiatives of the last two years. Um, it is incredible. Eh? The, 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 there is an absolute focus of the European Commission uh, that drafts almost all financial regulations. Eh? Uh, there is almost no Belgian financial regulation anymore. It's all European. And the focus is very much on, on uh, sustainable finance. Um, I will not go over all of them, uh, but uh, we have the taxonomy uh, defines uh, what what green uh, economic activities are, and that with with the aim of of um, creating products and creating more uh, investments into these green uh, economic uh, activities. Uh, also, benchmarks have been regulated. Uh, also, MIFID, that's an important one. Um, in the next review of the MIFID, and, uh, for those who do not know MIFID, MIFID is a regulation that requires financial advisors to draft uh, an investor profile uh, uh, to make sure that they only sell suitable financial products uh, to an investor. Um, and and for, for, for drafting this investor profile, they need to ask uh, a number of questions uh, to the client, for instance, uh, uh, about his income, about his, his knowledge of the financial instruments, his investment horizon, uh, these are all important questions to determine if a specific financial product is suitable for a specific client. Now with this review, it will also be required that the financial advisor uh, asks for the sustainability preferences of a client. And that answer to that question uh, will determine which types of products can be offered to a client. So that will make uh, will have a, a very serious uh, impact on, on the offer of the types of, of, of financial products. Um, there are also uh, uh, some, some, some regulations uh, uh, being drafted about uh, green bonds, uh, eco-labels, and, and a lot about disclosure. Also, on an international level, um, uh, about between regulators and the network for central banks and supervisors uh, that is drafting guidelines uh, to integrate sustainability in uh, banking uh, supervision. And also on, on the level of the UN, uh, there is a, an important uh, initiative, the Principles for Responsible Banking, and that's an initiative, a charter and a commitment uh, that banks can sign, and, and a lot of banks, also Belgian banks, have already signed that. Um, and that's a commitment to align their uh, business practices with the objectives of the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals, and also to make this, this progress, this alignment, measurable and uh, reportable. The Third and last element I want to talk about was on, on, on the role of the financial sector in mobilizing and reorienting capital uh, towards uh, societal goals. Uh, in, this, in this picture, you indeed see that um, the financial sector has a key uh, a central uh, place between uh, the, the people, uh, the end investors, and, and the initiatives, the companies that, that develop solutions to societal uh, problems. And it is indeed that financial sector that, that uh, reorients and, and mobilizes the capital towards these uh, SDGs. Also in the European Green Deal, uh, that, uh, the Green Deal that wants to make Europe the first uh, fully climate neutral um, continent by 2050. That Green Deal is, is, is very aware that the money that is needed to, to, uh, to achieve these uh, goals must come from the private sector. Huh? 
uh, only one third of the money that's needed to reach these goals uh, can come from the public sector. Uh, two thirds of the money uh, needs to come from, from private investors. Uh, and, and that needs to be facilitated by, by the financial sector. Uh, how can the financial sector do that, that reorienting and, and mobilizing of capital toward these sustainable uh, goals? Uh, there, are, there are a number of ways, a number of solutions um that are already offered uh, you can do that in in a direct way uh for instance by by green bonds or social bonds uh, these are financial products uh, of which the proceeds go directly to financing uh energy efficient or green or social projects um, you also have green loans, uh, for instance, specific mortgages um, for for renovation of, of, of housing, energy efficient renovation of housing. Uh, there are uh, specific instruments uh, to, uh, to finance circular economy uh, projects, because that's a very different business model. It needs very different types of risk assessment and different types of uh, financing instruments. You have blended finance instruments, and that's a mix between public finance and private finance, and also impact investing uh, initiatives. These are the more direct uh, solutions that exist, but there is also there are also solutions that are uh, that that support the the transition and the reorientation of capital in a more indirect way for instance um, sustainability linked loans is is something fairly new um, that general loan given to to, to a company uh, but the interest rate for that uh, loan uh, depends on the sustainability score of that company so uh, if the company becomes more sustainable as time goes by, the interest rate will drop. If the sustainability score uh, goes down, then the interest rate for the loan goes up. So that's um, and another um, example of, of an indirect way to, to shift the financial sector or to uh, reorient capital is via uh, SRI investment products and the sustainable funds, the ESG funds. Um, and about that latest, uh, the, the, these ESG or SRI funds, uh, I have dedicated a specific slide. Uh, Luke already um, mentioned it. Uh, since last year, uh, there exists uh, in, in the Belgian market uh, a label and a quality standard for specifically those uh, sustainable uh, investment products. Uh, uh, it's, it's more than just investment, it's, it's all financial products because there are also sustainable savings products and sustainable insurance products. And since last year, there exists this quality standard and a label. And that quality standard, what does that do? It 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 sets a, a minimal uh, level of sustainability that needs to be met uh, for 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 that product to be yeah to call him itself credible, uh, sustainable in in a credible way. So it it. it the quality standard sets out uh, a number of conditions that that product needs to meet uh, before it can call itself sustainable. Uh, of course, it also encourages the, the, the managers of these products to go much farther than these minimal conditions uh, and to become even more uh, sustainable or more strict or more dedicated to specific teams. Um, but in, in essence, it wants to, 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 to give a certain level of guarantee, a minimal level of sustainability. And what does that contain, these, these conditions or these minimal criteria? 
uh, it, it are criteria, for instance, about the exclusion of harm and harmful investments. Uh, so, for instance, uh, uh, an, an, a product that, that wants that label uh, cannot invest in, in, uh, in tobacco in this is switches. I go back. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, it cannot go. Uh, cannot invest in tobacco, in weapons, in coal mines, and 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 uh, also the investing in in conventional oil and gas companies is is limited. To, to companies that uh, are uh, have a strategy uh, and that are transitioning uh, towards climate neutrality. And also on the level of transparency, there are uh, a number of, of criteria. And, and the whole thing, uh, the label uh, and the quality standard is, is supervised by an independent uh, organization. And it's also evolutive. That means that the criteria for these kinds of sustainable products are evaluated every two years to make sure that the product and, and the definition of sustainability, or if you can call it definition, is still in line with, with the societal needs, but in line with the demands of the investors, in line with, with regulation. Uh, so for this reason, it is, uh, Evalu uh, evaluated every two years, and that's a process that's going on uh, at this very, uh, very moment. What is the, the the ultimate aim of this initiative is indeed to raise the level of of sustainability of the whole financial market. Uh, it is not the idea to create a niche of very sustainable financial institutions that offer very sustainable products. Uh, but to a very limited degree and, and of course also a very limited impact on the whole system. What we want to do is have a qualitative standard that involves all financial institutions and also all investors and not the most convinced and dedicated investors but also the very defensive and very conservative investors. There need to be sustainable solutions for all types of, of, of investors. Um, and with the idea of mainstreaming ESG and sustainability in the whole financial market and, and raising the level uh, of sustainability. Um, and I think I will, I will leave it by that because uh, I see that time is running fast and maybe better to uh, reserve some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, indeed, we are supposed to end at 17 uh, at 19:30 at uh, 7:30. But um, I, I did get a number of questions, um, so I will uh, forward them to, to David and to the other participants. Uh, um, and so, if we go over time, uh, well, it will stop by itself. Uh, um, David, I had questions on. Yeah, you, you have seen, uh, Tom showed all these EU initiatives. Uh, you say, well, we need to go back to the purpose of finance. Do you think that what happens now within the EU, is that a good starting point? Or is that just yeah. uh, mop, uh, mop and mark the system? This is, this is Lever's question. Yep. And I, yep. I, look, I, I'm in favor. I, I, my background, by the way, is I chair the, the finance initiative for the UN in the run-up to the Paris conference. And so I've got a little bit of background on and, and, and feel quite passionately about climate finance. And so I would support it. But in terms of what I was saying um, this evening, I, I think that um, I'd worry about, uh, like Hugo, about too much regulation, that, that actually what we're trying to do here is to construct a finance system that does what it, that fulfills its purpose in the first place. So I'd be in favour of what it is that the European finance plan says. But do you know, the amazing thing is, look, you look through the academic literature in all those rated finance journals, find me one study <laughs> that says what is it that people really want from the finance industry? You will mm. not find that study. Mm. And, and, and I find that shocking. Um, but I think they want a place to keep their money safe. I think they want a pension. They want the various different things. And I think the economy 
needs money to be put in the places where that money is needed and and mm -hmm. i i wonder whether the you know could could we start that debate um uh, on the power uh, uh, uh is saying is is there a way we can work together absolutely we should be working together and Vicente, you might look go on the website of a, a group called share action who i think are rather interesting which is to try and bring people together to demand that their fund managers start to take some of these things seriously so i'm in favor of the sustainable finance plan i i would be in favor of the things that tom has talked about as well but but i think just the starting point has to be what do we want from this system because we get bits and bobs of it in different countries but we don't have this systemically yeah thank you very much i i, I would corroborate that and uh, and again i indeed i think one of the, the things that you need if you ask the question what's the purpose of finance this is not talking about we need to regulate the system uh, uh, stronger and so on that's not the point the point is that you want to have a financial system with a different mission with a clear mission, it's with a clear it's impact, that's what you want. And so there is a vicious circle in terms of financial scandals and regulation going on and on and on. And so what you get is a highly regulated sector. And this is one of the reasons why you have all these specialists there, which increase the cost of the financial system, as David pointed out in his speech. This, this, this vicious circle between regulation, scandal, regulation is really killing the entire purpose of the system. And so at a certain point, you have to do a control or delete. You have to do a cold start in which you have to rethink why do we exist? Why are we there? And, and I, again, I would follow David also in the frustration I have with uh, educating our finance specialists is that we do not treat this, uh, this question. We do not talk about it, not in our finance books, not in the, the lessons we give or, or just to, at the side sometimes if you're lucky. And that, I think, is the main message of uh, this whole contribution. I, I think that's right. Just a silly statistic to add to that, Luke. When I started in investment in pensions and thinking about all of this, it was about uh, 30 years ago, there were 3,000 pages of regulations for pensions in the UK. As of mm. last year, there were 166,000 pages of regulation. Yeah. And I, I can't really tell you what is so much better about the pension system last year. Yeah than it was 30 years ago, but more than 50 times the amount of regulation. So we, we can't keep doing this, allow mm -hmm. the system to run right and then regulate it. We've got to start yeah. thinking about what do we want from it. And of course, many of the things that, that Tom's doing, I think are terrific and many of the goals as well that Frank's got, I would completely agree with, but but maybe there's a different model and it's the way we think about it, it's the way we teach it. And, and by the way, it is the consumer demanding, demanding change. Mm -hmm. So, so if any of the other and would like to intervene, Frank, Tom, on this, please do. Yeah, Frank, you have to put your mic on. There's many interesting questions, but I think that I will focus on one, actually. No, there's two things. Uh, there's First, uh, there's a comment of uh, Caroline, which uh, uh, say, says, um, if you would do it like the one shareholder, one vote, then no company would go uh, public uh, anymore, and you wouldn't have this uh, effect anymore of, uh, of 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 like that you can pull so many resources, right? And um, well, I'm not 100% sure about this, but uh, I tend to believe her. I'm not really sure about this, but let's say that she's right. Well, then we have a very big problem because it means that. Uh, this financial system cannot deal with democratic insight, and that's that is a pro that that is a very big problem. So it, it's not a, a well. I don't have the exact uh, 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 like specific solution on, on this one, but I think uh, that that says that there then there is not a problem with uh, the demand for more insight and more. Uh, 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 democracy in the financial system or that people let's say outside the system have something to say no there's a problem with how it functions and if it's if this is not possible um, and the other one was a, a, a more specific point I wanted to make on on the green deal um, as Tom says like uh, uh, I don't uh, the number was like one third or 
two thirds of the money has uh, is supposed to come from the private sector. You mentioned the program on uh, uh, renovating or isolating houses, which is very interesting, I think, because um, here is where you have a, 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 a contradiction. Uh, there cannot be we cannot uh, there cannot be this much profitability in the renovating of the houses. There is many studies that point out that uh, a large part of the of the housing. Uh, to renovate it, there is no business model. And in general, uh, it's also it's a paper by the the, the Belgian uh, Central Bank, uh, which said that the biggest uh, blockage towards uh, more money going into green is that the uh, perceived profitability or at least short-term profitability of green investments is not seen as as high enough or it's too risky. And the best way that they see to overcome this is um, is uh, uh, access or uh, like subsidizing um, uh, the profits or to make sure that uh, public investments, which in the Green Deal uh, uh, construction would be mostly be the like the European Investment Bank or other uh, national promotional uh, banks, uh, that they take the largest part of the risk. And as such, I'm all in favor of the public uh, uh, sector and the private sector working together. I think we all. Uh, step in to deal with climate change. But here comes a very important uh, question. If we're going to finance the transition in a socially just way, the risks and the benefits have to be shared in a very equal way. Otherwise, we're going to lose of our scarce public resources to subsidize uh, the profit expectations of uh, private financial institutions. And if the, 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 the profitability uh, of of the many uh, uh, economic uh, initiatives that we need to do the transitions, which will have a lot of societal societal benefits, if this, uh, uh, this profitability will be only later later will be only uh, on a very long term or sometimes uh, not even exist. The profitability uh, uh, wish be an impediment. Let's say that we don't have the luxury of this. So this is, I think, a, a, a topic we have to deal with. And for the Dutch readers, uh, I prepared this post. We have a research which really deals with this. So I'll put it in the comments and you can read it if you want. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Uh, Tom, do you have a short reaction on this? Or on the questions that you saw passing by? I, I have reacted in the chat to one very specific question. Uh... Uh, about uh, about a label and having different scores uh, mm -hmm. for different mm -hmm. types of products. Look, you also uh, refer mm -hmm. to, to the usefulness of a Nutri score for uh, financial mm -hmm. products. Uh, that could be that could be nice, but I think it will be to be too too simplistic. Um, because if you rate a fridge, you can look at how much energy it consumes, and that one indicator determines the label uh, of the fridge. Uh, if you look at the Nutri score, you can look at how much sugar is in the product, and you have your Nutri score. If you have to look at a financial product, at an investment fund, you need to look at potentially hundreds of KPIs. Um, and it is very difficult to, to see which KPI is most important. Eh? Is it the CO2 emissions of the companies you're investing in, or is it the working conditions uh, of the employees of these companies? And that are only two, um, or the, the wood and the water that is used by these companies. So if you have to take all that together and put it all in one score, I'm a little bit afraid of, of of how useful and 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 how credible such a thing would be, but that does not mean that that uh, it could be interesting to to have some more differentiation between sustainable products without going to to yeah one score. Um, uh, about um, the what what Frank. Uh, said about uh, the riskiness, the riskiness of green investments. That is indeed uh, a difficult, uh, a difficult question. Uh, 
Um, it, it is the case that, and that, that's also a systemic uh, question, uh, also result of um, the regulations uh, that have come in place after after the financial crisis, uh, that uh, banks are very much encouraged to not take any more risks. Uh, certainly, uh, yeah, regular regular savings banks, which for the most part the Belgian banks are. Uh, uh, it is banks are. Uh, by by the the capital requirement rules are very much punished if they uh, if they make long if they give uh, long term uh, loans uh, and and in in uh, in sustainability long term loans uh, loans are are very much uh, important in, uh, very big infrastructure pro uh, projects need very long term loans uh, are sometimes more risky uh, green uh, uh, green and innovative uh, projects and that is very much uh, punished on the level of capital requirements um, because it is determined as as more risk uh, more risky and banks are encouraged to take much less risk than before uh, so we need to find a, a right balance uh, and not to de-risk too much, because uh, then if, you, if a financial sector cannot take risks anymore, then it's one of its main functions becomes obsolete, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Tom. So again, uh, I can think that the notion of risk is again too much uh, systemic risk in finance. Uh, there is also a risk if we don't start to change the way we build our houses, isolate our houses, there will be another risk. And so that is the larger risk that is also the question how to bring that in. Um, uh, David, I would like to go back to you. Do you have some last comments? Because we're yeah, running well, almost just, 10 just minutes on, over just time. On, just, just on this point, because we've had a number of questions about sort of reporting and what's going on there. But mm. I think this is, this is it, it, uh, it, I think actually the, the moves that we're seeing, I've forgotten who it was that asked, was it Dirk who asked the question about the TCFD and IFRS? I think actually we're seeing some positive uh, uh, things there in terms of reporting, but just on the risk point that you were uh, uh, mm. talking about, look, this has taken up just a huge amount of my time in the last six months, but I think we're getting there. You know, the way we control work, uh, we control risk, is we have an accounting system that makes sure that limited liability companies are are, are ones that are uh, solvent and sustainable. And yet, until a year ago. We've had no guidance that said that climate needed to be taken into account when we did that. That is just crazy. That's why we've got that system. And, 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 and so I've been working on that and I do have some reforms that are coming through. And I, I hope next year you will see really many hundreds of billions of assets that will need to be written off because they're inconsistent with a sustainable climate. But how could we have had to wait so long for this risk system? that we've got, which is the accounting system, actually to deliver for us. And, and I do think when I talk to fund managers and say to them, why is it that you're now proposing to do all these nice environmental things? They always come back and say, because that's what our customers and clients are now demanding of us. And if you really want to get that leverage, I think this needs a demand from everyone, the finance industry, is there to serve us that should be the starting point and we should demand it that we start to structure an industry that works to purpose but i could talk about this all evening and i know that most people need to get to dinner <laughs> yes indeed indeed so we've run almost 15 minutes over time and there are many other interesting and and, and relevant questions um many things which i would like to go into but that will be another uh, session i'm afraid there's one which I have in my mind already on labels because people talk about we have so many labels. Well, for your information, we have around 490 in Europe at this moment. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's terrible. Uh, um, but um, I mean, topics enough for our next uh, gathering. For the time being, I would like to thank the public. I would like to thank David, Frank, and Tom uh, for taking part in this highly interesting discussion.
if you have any questions left, don't hesitate to send them through, uh, and I will try to get them to the people involved and also try to answer them. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much uh, for participating in this. And, and can Have I good thank evening. you, you Luke yeah. and, and, and Tom and Frank, and especially to Ninka as well, without whom, uh, from my point of view, none of this would have been possible. So thank you all. Absolutely. Thank you, Ninka. Thank you, too. Thank you. It was a lovely bye, experience. Bye, bye. <laughs> bye. bye everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Eat well. Bye.